Hi everyone, I think we can get started today. Uh, it's a very special day because today the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has just released its work group two report, which is focused on health impact on climate change. So today we are very, very pleased to have Dr. Kim Norton join us. Um, Dr. Norton is a senior scientist at the National Resource Defense Council. Uh, she's also assistant professor at the Columbia University of Melbourne School of Public Health, the Department of Environmental Health Sciences. And she has been a senior member for the, one of the first climate health programs in the uh, country. So um, Dr. Norton specialized in the human health impact of climate change. She served as the co cool convening lead author for the human health chapter of the US third um, national climate assessment as a member of the second and the fourth New York City panels on climate change and participated in the IPCC's fourth and fifth reports. Uh, her work with the New York uh, Climate and Health Project, which you will uh, hear about later, uh, described some of the very first downscaled global to regional climate and health assessment modeling in the US, which um, to me is also one of my uh, the, the kind of inspired which inspires me to do my thesis, uh, uh, PhD thesis on this topic. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome um, Dr. Kim Norton. Thank you, Kai. You are so kind. And thanks to you and Maro for helping with the technology and just for the invitation and really everyone in the room on such an auspicious news day. As Kai said, it's just huge. I am really honored that you're taking some time to be here with me and us talking about climate change and how it affects people's health. Certainly a topic near and dear to my heart. And uh, this is gonna be, I think a pretty personal um, conversation with you. I'm not representing you know, NRDC or Columbia University officially. I'm gonna tell you some things about my personal experiences in this field, uh, as Kai said, from some pretty early days in the climate and health world and to uh, where I am now as a scientist advocate, still at the Natural Resources Defense Council most of my time and still at Columbia. But uh, I hope that I'll talk a little bit, give you a sense of my slow conversion from someone who probably somewhat idealistically and blithely thought data, it's all about data once I can do or someone can do a great study and just bring forward those connections between climate change and health. That'll be it. Then we'll just march into, you know, climate policy and health protections and all will be well. Well, I'm a firm believer that it takes a lot more than that as we all see from our experience. And I'm gonna try and save time at the end for a lot of discussion time between us too. So thank you, Motto and Kai for keeping me honest on that. So I'll give you a few tidbits about what I've experienced along the way as we go. Um, I work most of my time now is spent at the Natural Resources Defense Council, an environmental not-for-profit that was established more than 50 years ago by a group of young attorneys who had the idea that they would use the environment as their client. Environmental law didn't even exist as a field then. And we have, since that time, pretty much kept the same mission statement. And it's, it's a big one. It's a little bit ambitious to protect the earth, the wild places, the people, the health of all of those systems, and to ensure people's right to clean and healthy air, water, land, and the wild. So climate change and climate policy is really, if, there, if one had to pick one, it would be our overarching you know, theme that we work on. So it has sure been a, a challenge, but I'm so happy, satisfied, learn something, many things every day at this advocacy organization, working as I do in the health frame. Uh, so let's get started. Next slide, please. So this is a representation of me connecting the, the dots between climate change and health. I started actually as a geologist. I like those big systems. I loved earth systems and learning about how human activities affect the earth and the environment and vice versa, how envir environmental change affects our health. 
Uh, I was very influenced by some work I did on uh, radioactive waste management. I worked at a uh, group that was kind of the counterpart of the nuclear industry. We would try and find um, potential areas of concern in license applications that proposed radioactive waste sites. And there were a group of activists at a site we were working with in West Texas who impressed me mightily with their ability to link this environmental change to local health. We can't have this rad waste facility here because the groundwater will bring it into our town, you know, the radionuclides contamination and no, we can't have it. And they were successful and powerful, small but mighty. And I thought, that's quite interesting. I, I would like to study that. So I ended up going back to school, to uh, City University in New York City, and then to uh, Columbia University, where I got uh, so many lucky breaks. I was lucky enough to be part of the New York Climate and Health Project. Next slide, please. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, this was uh, funded by the Environmental Protection Agency's STAR grants, Science to Achieve Results. It was really one of the first big US-based integrated assessment modeling projects and kind of funding proposals. So if we had global climate modelers who fed their information to regional climate modelers who worked with land use modelers. Then there was an atmospheric chemistry model that sort of used all those inputs and kind of at the end of this interconnected chain was the health risk assessment. Dr. Patrick Kinney, who was my research mentor, he's now at Boston University. He has been, continues to be a, a, a leading light in the climate and health field. And he gave me lots of opportunities, including when he shouted across the classroom, hey, Kim, are you still looking for a dissertation topic? I said, yes, I am. The one that I had in mind about uh, radioactive waste was not, was not taking shape. So I jumped on board the climate and health train, which in 2000 was kind of new. And I jumped on board and off we went. Next slide, please. That job of connecting the dots between climate change and our health was, uh, I mean, in the research community, it was starting to grow but kind of in the community at large, it was an absolutely new idea. And I have to say, 20 years later, it still is a constant conversation. Not only does climate change affect the environment and the Arctic and the Antarctic and polar bears and like non-human faces, it also affects people and some people far, far more than others. So this is a, an old chestnut, something from an article from the New York Times in 2003 that introduced this project that looked at the New York City tri-state area, 31 counties in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. And the, the novel thing then about the New York Climate and Health Project was health was the driver. At the end of that cascade, it was going to estimate the impacts to the health of people in New York City. It was gonna be specific to New York. It was gonna look in the future. At the time, these were new ideas. In this image, you see, uh, Dr. Cynthia Rosenzweig, who worked at NASA GIS, uh, with Jim Hansen, who was one of the, you know, like the pioneers of this whole climate impacts and climate change field. Uh, at the table, you see yours truly on the left and Pat Kinney. Cynthia, again, Joyce Rosenthal, who is a uh, urban planner, works in public health. So this was like the beginning, the blossoming of a really interdisciplinary team or transdisciplinary uh, next slide, please. And it was, and it still remains somewhat challenging to find the space, to find the funding, to find the journals, to find the academic appointments that kind of foster and feed interdisciplinary work. But there's been, you know, lots of progress in the years in between. It's, it's been a challenge, but a good one. We would meet every week for three years, that was the, the term of the NYCHP as we called it, uh, every week to learn each other's jargon and language and how do you do your modeling. We really had to come up with, over that time, a shared language, a shared vocabulary so that we could put together, link these models. And these are some of the images from the more than a dozen peer-reviewed journal papers eventually 
that came out of the project. So it was a very rich project. And you can see here kind of the some of the images that represent those different sectors whose impacts, climate impacts are being modeled. In the upper left is, I believe that looks like from the uh, uh, model resolution global climate change that was uh, dynamically downscaled to regional climate model temperature. Um, on the upper right, you see the results of the atmospheric chemistry modeling component that Christian Hogreef at the University of Albany uh, did beautiful work with his colleagues there. Uh, sort of below that, the lower right is uh, an, a figure from a paper that I was lucky enough to lead the team. This is all teamwork, you know, none of it is singular, but it was really one of the first times that people who live in a region in the US could look at their county. Those are counties that are kind of outlined and say, hey, in some future year, there's going to be an increase in premature mortality here. It's going to be how much hotter. I think that this was kind of the beginning of that geographic specificity that has become quite a quite a powerful way to use data. And in the lower left here is some land use change modeling. We look forward to the 2020s, 2050s, and 2080s. Um, next slide, please. This is just a little bit of a zoom in. And I know, Kai, that you you uh, like this paper and wanted me to talk about it. So here we are. Uh, these show the estimates of percent increases in summer ozone-related premature mortality, looking to the 2050s relative to the 1990s baseline. So here, again, you just get the sense of the kind of the regional in my backyard. Hey, that's my county. Hey, that's where my Aunt Sharon lives that came out of New York Climate and Health Project, which I think was part of why it created a foundation for other papers. What, what we found that was that overall there was a median 4.5% increase region-wide by the 2050s in that ozone-related premature mortality. Next slide, please. Um, Kai created this. Thank you very much for that. But it gives a sense of how the work of the New York Climate Health Project was, was useful in other papers that since have gone on to go much farther looking at how climate change affects air quality and then mortality. We know that uh, ground level ozone, it's a temperature and sunlight uh, sensitive formation chemistry reaction. So that's part of why climate change in particular uh, will serve to, you know, other things held constant, make it more challenging to meet uh, ozone regulations and will tend to increase ozone concentrations. Actually, the work of Michelle Bell, who's one of the faculty members at Yale, was also really instrumental in understanding this kind of regional and super regional effect. She uh, was lead author on a paper in climatic change that found estimated that there will be a 68% increase in ozone exceedance days by the 2050s. That is days that don't meet the eight hour standard. So this was some of the first times that we people really got a chance to um, like vibe that, hey, in my backyard where I live, climate change could affect my health. Because as we know, there's 25 million people, adults and children in the US that have asthma. Ozone can be a, you know, a trigger for asthma attacks. There's all kinds of reasons why this uh, is important. There was also a companion paper on heat and heat related premature mortality that came out of the New York Climate and Health Project that gave a view to you know, increases by the 2050s, like a 70% increase in premature heat related mortality. By the 2080s, a tripling in the New York metro region. So in a lot of ways it put ozone and air quality and heat on the uh, New York metro, I think, you know, sites for future work. Next slide, please. I'm gonna transition a little bit to um, the storytelling aspect, which has been a big feature of my work uh, at NRDC. As Cynthia Rosenzweig, uh, wise from Climate and Health Project said wisely, she called it the four Ps at the time, uh, which meant for her that proposals, you know, research proposals lead to projects, which lead to papers, but then they very much influence policy. And I would add 
um, people that you can't have those influences on policy kind of flowing from the data without people to make it happen. And then for better or worse, the, another P, kind of the sixth P is politics. These are all issues of science and health science um, that have become, as we know, so politicized um, in the years since and to this very day. So local stories help fuel advocacy. And next slide, please. It's my hope, uh, my belief that with health, climate change becomes very personal and that it can help motivate that kind of health protective advocacy. I'm showing this because it was a, this was a study conducted with the California Department of Public Health and some NRDC scientists, myself included, that uh, was published in 2009 in Environmental Health Perspectives. It was really one of the first US-based studies that looked at a big heat wave and its impact, not on premature mortality, but on morbidity on different illnesses, emergency room visits, hospitalizations in a big state. This is California. Um, you can see the counties on there, but these are kind of climatic zones in uh, California. Uh, there was a two week heat wave in 2006 that was um, really intense, had a really large geographic extent. And what this work found was to our surprise somewhat, there was a huge, I mean, you expect that there would be an increase in excess emergency room visits, but it was enormous. It was over 16,000 additional excess ER visits beyond what would typically be expected uh, at that season of the year. Uh, there were almost 1,200 excess hospitalizations. And you can see from this figure that um, the Central Coast region, which is on the Western and Central Coast, it includes the San Francisco Bay Area, while the temperatures there were not in an absolute sense the hottest temperatures on the state, the relative risk was uh, very high. And that is because the population there the infrastructure, the residences are not acclimatized, are not prepared for intense heat. There's a lot of residences that don't have air conditioning. So this was an interesting study. Another one that's been helpful to other people doing heat morbidity work. But it was also interesting because our partnership with the state um, Department of Health was really fruitful. We as an NGO, as a nonprofit, as an advocacy organization, could be kind of more forward and more direct with some of the messaging coming out of this. And they had the, you know, the de-identified uh, data, the statistical uh, analysts. It was a great kind of marriage of skills. And uh, I think it, that that is part of, I mean, my message to us. We all have a role in what we're trying to achieve in the way of both learning and taking our learnings to a wider audience, both public and policy making, to get the heck on board with more health protective climate policy. Government agencies have a critical role. NGO scientists have a critical role. You academic scientists have a critical role as do lots of other people, artists, writers, musicians, the people, children, elders, you know, community groups. We're all in this thing together. So. A little bit of my pitch for it, it takes a village, but next slide, please. To continue on that theme of uh, like making global climate change, which can be sometimes rather abstract or rather, let's say it's less abstract now after the last 10 years, that's for sure. But it can seem rather large scale. And I have found in my time at NRDC and working with partners there in particular, uh, that making global story local is hugely important. It brings it closer to home. It reflects people's lived experience from a media point of view, because working with the media successfully is important to get our science and our data out into the public sphere. It's great because if I do, as I have with you know my partners and colleagues, you see here in the map below, which I'll talk about a little bit more, we typically at NRDC use existing data sets, but try to put them together in novel ways that tell a health relevant story. And when we do that on a national uh, scale, like the map you see here, it means that news outlets and people and local newspapers in every one of those counties can look at the map and say, hey, what's this story? And we work with them to try and 
bring that local story to the fore. These are two URLs for some of the uh, websites that NRDC still has that uh, combine not only mapping tools like this, but also some information on the impacts writ large for people. And there's a lot of people who haven't been introduced to the connections between climate change and health. Uh, we also try to show preparedness and adaptation and action steps that are uh, happening locally at the state, even at the local level, to give people a, a sense of what they can do and see themselves in a kind of action frame in this story. Next slide, please. Um, while those two URLs are still current, I just wanted to take a little spin down memory lane, for me at least, and, and show you how the maps, uh, the online maps evolved. We've gotten a lot of very positive feedback through the years. It was like 2011, it's been a decade, a little bit more, yeah, a little bit more than a decade since those maps first came out. And this is the URL for the original site of climate maps. We made a large effort to bring together that statewide and then county level information. In that original site, we had more maps, actually. We had, we showed air quality, how climate change affects environmental change, and then related to health outcomes for air quality, extreme weather events, drought, flooding, extreme heat, one infectious disease, uh, dengue fever. So we tried to put the information there. Next slide, please. And we gave people a way to not only see the threat, uh, this shows what it used to look like. Uh, our website has been streamlined by much better designers. Well, you know, better designers, let's say. Certainly better than me. We also blog a lot. Our scientists, our policy experts blog. So they were all collected on the pages. Next slide, please. And we felt it was important to give people that sense of what they can do, like preparedness actions. It's just frustrating and, you know, frankly, can lead to a sense of, you know, a lack of agency to give people somewhat alarming health concerning news and not, you know, show a way to move their concern into action and movement. So we did try to do that. So this is just kind of sharing with you our thought process. We be, it began the MAP series as a poster session internal to NRDC. We got a lot of feedback from our colleagues and we took some time and we turned it into this, these online maps have since kind of maintained and sustained themselves as one of the most popular of NRDC's web pages. And we've gotten great feedback that they're great screening tools for local planners, Students have used them to inform uh, their local work. So we're glad that, that they met with success. Next slide, please. And um, this just gives a little view, I'll spin through these real fast. It, it shows in this case, this is a kind of co-locates ozone exceedance days, days uh, the year that this was mapped. It was 2007 when this first came out, but where there's ozone exceedance days, um, and where ragweed, which is a plant that produces an aeroallergenic pollen and tends to produce it in late summer, early fall, exactly the same time in much of the U.S. when ozone exceedance days in the hot and often still days of late summer can exacerbate ozone concentrations. And the two uh, conditions present a double whammy to health. The more sepia toned uh, areas in the map show where ozone exceedance days and uh, ragweed are co-located and found um, kind of a, a map of relative risks. This map kind of survived through the years, had a real evergreen kind of uh, lifespan because every year in the spring, it's tree pollen, in the summer, it's grass pollen, in the fall, it's ragweed. And there's a lot of pollen sufferers in the, in the country. So we find that, uh, this gives us an opportunity to bring up those interconnections year after year. Next slide, please. Um, and this is just one other example of those uh, national maps that take data sets and put them together in a novel way. This is the dengue fever. It maps where the two mosquito species, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, were at the time found in the US uh, using an ArboNet data set to map the vector. And it combined that with 
uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports of dengue fever cases. Most of those admittedly were imported cases from people traveling outside the US, becoming infected, coming back to home and developing infection and symptoms. But that said, it is feasible that uh, a mosquito vector could come into contact by a infected person and it could become a local transmission source. And there, there is local transmission of dengue fever in some areas of uh, Texas, of Florida, of Hawaii. So this again was just a, a mapping example that began a series of discussions that has had a long lifetime. Interestingly, the year after this came out, this came out in 2009 and in 2010, uh, CDC made dengue fever a reportable illness. We I take credit for that, but it's kind of indicative that the national dialogue was amped up for a lot of reasons around that infectious disease. Next slide, please. Um, so just some more URLs, because I want you to have resources when, uh, when I'm here and when we're done. We at NRDC have put together rather detailed climate health fact sheets for, I think, seven states. Michigan is shown here. We also have California, Colorado, Illinois, Virginia, Washington, and Pennsylvania. Um, a lot of detail, a lot of citations for people that may be doing climate health work in those areas. Um, and the last link is our current uh, URL that tries to put together in one place the climate and health work. And we'll be updating this soon. Next slide, please. Okay, checking my time. I'm rounding the bend to two other huge opportunities, uh, huge learning experiences for me, but, um, and I'll talk about them a little bit first. NCA3, National Climate Assessment, the third US National Climate Assessment. Um, I was fortunate enough to work on this effort as one of the co-convening lead authors for the human health chapter. This was back in, of 2011 through 2014. There has since been a fourth iteration of the National Climate Assessment, and right now the work on the fifth uh, assessment is underway. But this was a huge learning opportunity for me, not only to network with amazing scientists and see how the NCA reports come out, but it was very gratifying and interesting that this was the vintage of NCA when the here and now message really came to the fore. The climate impacts on health are happening here and now in the US. Probably the first time that's been so loud and clear. Translation, the whole effort was aimed to make all the information in all the chapters entirely digestible, not just to you know academics or scientists working in the field, but to everyone, to the uh, you know the public. And I really respect that and learned a lot from that effort. And third, vulnerability. It was one of the first times that the differential, the disparate, the inequitable vulnerability of some places and people and communities to climate change really was emphasized. Next slide, please. This is just some reflection on that here and now in the, in the years since that effort. Sadly, year after year, it seems like we you know, just get more of the lived experience of climate change. Uh, years 2013 to the present, all of them in the top 10 warmest years globally ever recorded. Uh, the two gentlemen in the upper left are members of the National Medical Association. They were surveyed, their members found 86% of their surveyed members said climate change is directly relevant to patient care. I mean, the physicians, the, both the public health and medical communities, and more and more people are learning about climate change from life, from experience, and less so from reports and academic efforts. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, something else that NCA3 and other reports certainly have done is this. Uh, the view on the left is under a relatively lower greenhouse gas emissions scenario. The one on the right under a relatively higher emission scenario and kind of painting the difference in this case here. If you could just go back advanced, yeah, that happens. Thank you, thank you. Uh, giving a sense of the difference between the low uh, emission scenario, like uh, three degrees Fahrenheit difference between uh, now and the hottest days of the 2090s versus on the right, higher emissions, more like a 10 degrees Fahrenheit 
difference on the uh, highest temperature on the hottest days, giving a sense of what we can accomplish and what we can avoid by moving with all haste toward cleaner energy. Now, next slide, please. And I bet you in this course and in your work, you talk a lot and we're all cognizant of, you know, the elderly, the, the very young, economically disadvantaged, many communities of color, people with pre-existing conditions, certain locations, not equally vulnerable to climate health effects. The IPCC report that uh, Kai mentioned that came out today estimates that basically half of the world's population, like 3.6 billion, live in what they're calling hot spots. You have to wonder if half of the world's population lives in a hot spot, kind of, kind of changes the meaning of hot spot. In other words, billions of us are highly vulnerable and highly exposed. Next, uh, next slide, please. I wanna mention kind of in this transition of data is great, it's very rich, but what can we do with it? Um, partnerships, taking your findings, your work, your projects, your papers, your knowledge, and using it to learn about the lived experience, about local knowledge, local expertise in partnership with people, communities, and groups who live in some of those highly exposed and vulnerable areas. It's what makes the work real. It can really turn uh, the data that we have into action. And I wanna share with you a story, uh, you know, my, Again, great fortune. Next slide, please. In working with NRDC and partners in Ahmedabad, uh, India, a city in Western India in Gujarat state, I actually see one of my dear colleagues and partners from that work uh, is here today. I'm very glad, Dr. Pavian. Um, in 2010, this city experienced what was for Ahmedabad a historic heat wave. Um, this is a news report that there were over 50 people who had died, but Next slide, please. It turns out that upon further investigation among this partner team with the local experts and health scientists and researchers and NRDC researchers, it was more like th over 1300 excess deaths in the month that the heat wave occurred. This graphic became known as the graph because it, it told a story graphically that had great meaning and uh, motivated the, um, the Anubad Municipal Corporation leadership, fantastic leadership from the city to, who said, no more. This peak that one can see in the red upper, uh, upper line of a peak in more uh, with maximum temperature, that's the maximum temperature peak right below it, daily death counts. Then mayor said, no more. I do not want this to happen again to you know, the people of Omnibad. So. Next slide, please. The city, the leadership at uh, our great partners, Indian Institute of Public Health in Gandhinagar, NRDC, other experts helped the city put together a heat action plan. Then the first in all of South Asia with an early warning system with outreach to the most vulnerable, heat vulnerable communities with extra like dialogue with health professionals, with outreach to the media. And it really changed the whole Kind of equation dynamic appreciation of heat, extreme heat as an approachable public health issue that and we can do something about it. Next slide, please. Um, the people of Omnibad as well as city leadership took this issue and made it their own. This shows uh, women and uh, people having a parade through the uh, streets of the city to raise awareness. On the right, you see city leaders uh, coding rooftops white to be more reflective and reduce indoor temperatures. Next slide, please. And actually, we were able to conduct an evaluation of the work in Omnibot and found that there were, in the years after the launch of the heat action plan in 2013, and the years after, the city avoided 1,100 uh, premature deaths. Not strictly heat-related, but the deaths in, their, um, in the summer heat season were reduced dramatically from could be a, a host of different reasons, but surely the heat action plan factored into that. And that was published um, in Journal Environmental and Public Health. Dr. Jeremy Hess was uh, the lead author on that. 
Um, next slide, please. I'm rounding the bend, and I want to uh, say thank you to Omnibot, as always, our partners there um, for that amazing work, which continues both in terms of uh, extreme heat, and now we're working on air pollution as well. But to bring it, our climate and health work and data back home, this is an appreciation of the health-related costs of climate change. You could definitely say we're already paying for climate change with our health. Next slide, please. In 2011, NRDC, I was lucky to work on this work, um, took the first look from already published reports, papers on kinds of events that are uh, going to increase in future in intensity and duration and frequency with climate change, climate sensitive events and health outcomes related to them. The heat wave, wildfire seasons, uh, hurricane seasons, you can see kind of the array across the US. And in that first study, we found, uh, we were surprised to find $14 billion in health related costs just from six of those events that were documented. Surely those are not the only six such events that occurred in that time, but we lack integrated databases that give an ability to discern the whole fabric of climate sensitive events. Next slide, please. But this interest in valuation continued strongly with this report uh, and the fourth national climate assessment. Next slide, please. And my NRDC colleague, Dr. Vijay Lamai, just, just advance it a couple of times if you don't mind, please. And we will see that uh, Dr. Lamai looked at just one year, 2012. Again, look through the literature to document events. This was uh, uh, 10 different events and came up with uh, $10 billion in health-related costs, typically unassigned. Health costs are not included when you hear about NOAA's billion-dollar disaster tally. Next slide. Um, this is really important information for us to keep in mind, that there would be over 37,000 encounters related to those climate-sensitive events with these kind of costs, and two-thirds of the illness costs being paid uh, for Medicare and Medicaid encounters, these kind of realities need to be factored in when, at least for me, when I hear people say it's going to be so expensive to make that leap to greener and cleaner energy. We have to put health into the picture. Next slide, please. I know I'm a little over, but we're almost done. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, had Dr. Ed Maybach from George Mason University come and speak with you but he is a real leader and has been for, for a while in this climate and health messaging, along with uh, your colleagues at Yale University for sure. But Ed Maybach has a way of putting it like this. It's you know five messages. Experts agree, climate change, it's real. It's us, it's anthropogenic. It's bad, yes. The more we learn, the more sobered we are by the impacts and their effects on people's health, but these are solvable issues. Um, next slide, please. But they're solvable when we take our knowledge and our outrage, perhaps at the knowledge we learn, and we determine that we're gonna protect the people, the places that we care about, and the people in places that we can't even see, perhaps, because it is, we are a global community. There is no doubt. Um, and when we protect the most vulnerable, those who are on the front lines of you know, suffering the worst impact, when we go first to them, we learn a great deal. We help them you know, most imminently. We help ourselves to build that healthier and more secure future that data is really about. Because if data doesn't help us connect with each other, and connect to the like the the last doc, which is I don't want my children, my grandchildren, to live in a science fiction. I want to give them like a future, you know, in my small part that's worth living, and a current day that is you know worth fighting for. And we're going to do that. So with that, next slide or two. Thank you. Uh, we'll keep our eyes open our hearts open and our data streams open to learn about the differential impacts of climate change on our health around the globe with all humility and respect. And that's me.
And that's where you can find me at that at the NRDC email. I'm at Columbia, but I pick up emails mostly from NRDC. And we blog. And now, lucky me, I get a chance hopefully to listen to you and your experiences, concerns, questions. So the last slide is just, you know, the question. But if you want to leave the contact info up there, Kai, that would be fine. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for giving me a chance to talk with you and tell you my story. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thanks for the wonderful story from your research to policy, uh, to the community engagement until the policy. So I think we can first give a round of applause for For all this joining online, uh, if you do have questions, please uh, feel free to post your question in the chat box. But uh, we actually have already gathered a lot of questions from our students. Um, uh, our students read some of the readings materials you sent. And I think um, I summarized some into big categories. So the very first question uh, many students are having is that you showed your uh, 2011 paper on the cost uh, of the health uh, health impacts of climate change, and also uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Wellard's the 2019 Geo Health paper. Yeah. The students are wondering, like, uh, we know this is, uh, message is important, but um, have you been surprised at um, at all with how your data has been used, or by who has been citing it, and um, do you see any impact from using your paper? in politics or in mm -hmm. implementation? Mm -hmm. uh, I will give a few examples. And I, I think that the headline is, yes. Uh, yes, it's starting. Uh, I could tell. First, I'll answer the question, then maybe I'll go back to the genesis of the, of the health cost work. Yes, from almost the start, when Dr. Speak to Dr. Lamai in particular, because frankly, the 2019, the GeoHealth paper that you have both the paper and the fact sheet from, uh, Dr. Vijay did a really interesting analysis that got to a lot more of the particulars. And we found that in among the 10 sites that were the case studies, there were there was interest from some uh, like governor's offices in some of the states. We heard the paper referenced in congressional hearings uh, on climate and health topics. Uh, the earlier 2011, that first work that NRDC uh, worked on with uh, their health economists at University of California, that was cited recently in an amicus brief. That is, you know, when friends of the court get together and put together evidence that supports their side. That was cited in support of you know kind of the, the previous uh, court findings uh, kind of asserting and I'm sorry EPA's ability to regulate greenhouse gases it was cited there uh, it got both of the valuation studies got quite a lot of press uh, at the time so between media and those mentions in state and federal level hearings. I wouldn't say that, you know, legislation has not been based on them. It's not always like a law or a regulation per se, but just to see the work used in a policy making, policy building framework is very satisfying. And, you know, that I think that for any of us, when we see our science kind of move out of the ivory tower or off the bookshelf, and into, you know, movement toward action. That's great. That's why, it's only speaking personally, that's why I do this. And I don't even expect that it's going to happen. But when it does, it feels good. Thanks, Kim. Uh, here comes a relatively more technical question regarding how you actually calculate the, uh, you know, economic burden of this cost. So the students are not uh, very familiar with for example, the, the statistical life lost. And they're wondering like, uh, for example, they understand uh, if you have the Hurricane uh, Sandy, you can calculate the, the health damages, but they're not quite sure about how you calculate, for example, let's see the ozone pollution, uh, the ozone air pollution in Nevada. So how did you, uh, you know, calculate the 
cost associated with this morbidity and mortality? Mm -hmm. I'll try to do a, a decent job, just noting that Dr. Lamai could do an awesome job because he knows the uh, inside and out the, uh, the method. But uh, to your two, I mean, the two main components of the valuation assignment are the mortality and the morbidity. The mortality, the val it, value of a statistical life is the basis for that cost assignment. It, it is a, we've had a lot of discussion, a lot of questions about what that means. It's in wide use. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, for example, has used it for many years. It kind of evolves. It is not a statement about the value, the inherent value of life. It's uh, comprised of kind of looking at Again, statistically, a large group of people and the what people would pay to avoid risk of death across, you know, a large and, you know, millions of people and then assigning that. So it's a way of assigning uh, willingness to pay to avoid death. That may not have helped much, but just to be clear, it's not a statement of life value. For the morbidity for the emergency room visits, hospitalizations, outpatient visits, home health care, medications, there are two fantastic databases, uh, Healthcare Utilization Project, HCUP, and the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey, MAPS, that were used to take uh, the already tabulated health outcomes. We used already existing reports, either published literature or state or federal reports, excuse me, um, and then to assign a value to uh, the cost related to treatment, care in those different categories. So we're using kind of national data sets to assign appropriate costs to what was already documented and then adding it adding those costs together and trying to always use and apply a consistent methodology. If you look in the GeoHealth paper at table four, it gives you a sense of the different types of costs that are that go into the totals uh, for the different locations and uh, different health outcomes. So I recommend, if that wasn't entirely satisfying, check out table four in the geo health paper. But those are, are great questions. I mean, we could have a whole, or maybe you do want to have a whole session with Dr. Lamai to dig in because it's fascinating. And of course, the methodological work is evolving all the time. It, it showed us very clearly the great value of uh, having, or let's say our goal to advocate for more integrated climate health and cost data sets because we had to spend quite a bit of time and effort to assemble the different data sets used to eventually assign those costs. I hope that helped a bit. That helps a lot. Thank you, Kim. Uh, we do have a, a question from our online audience from Leo Wincy. Uh, uh, the question is, as we saw in the US and worldwide, directly related to the shutdowns and the closures we made at the start of the pandemic, the pollution level was dropped. So how do we get back on track with those gains that we have now lost? <sighs> and the reference, and this is a question, uh, just to be clear, the fact that emissions are rising again after the diminishment because owing to relating to the economic shutdown and like diminished transportation, travel, economic activity. How do we get back on track? Uh, well, we've seen the kind of reductions that are possible, not to in any way minimize the, the journey that, and you know, the suffering, the loss that people have been through, continue to be through with the pandemic, um, not to equate the two in any way. But I think we, with everything that's happening right now, the realization of that climate impacts 
associated air pollution, associated flooding, heat related mortality and morbidity are just accelerating. We, there simply must be a commitment, a demand to move toward cleaner energy systems whereby no matter what is happening, we can support robust economic activity and not be polluting and creating the health harms today and the climate related harms in future. I think if anything, you know, it, it sobers us as to how vulnerable we are as a global society to a pandemic, how differential the vulnerabilities are, how we have to pay attention to the inequities, but we simply have to invest and demand cleaner energy now. There is no time to wait. Very powerful message. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as you may know, like uh, the uh, our students are the uh, MPH students uh, and the master students in other schools. So uh, they are wondering, like, for public health students, if they're interested in this field, I want to you know make it that. Uh, to intend or at the uh, future career plans. So what kind of skills do you think that the students are currently lacking or maybe it's best for them to uh, have in order to be successful in this field? Well, first, good, great, keep your interest alive. We need you. We need you, the field, the world needs you so badly. Please continue, you know, with every week, with every month, every year, the need is greater. So good for you, I applaud you. Um, master MPH students, continue your basic, you know, skill building. I mean, epidemiology, statistics, uh, you know, environmental health, core, sociomedical sciences, uh, all of it, it it's foundational to uh, communication, building communication skills, uh, writing more. Is there an outlet where you can, you know, blog or write essays or write, you know, write, 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 and listen, listen, listen. Talk with other people. Talk with, you know, use every opportunity to to hone your own speaking and listening skills, because the amount of of information and learning and studies that are coming out is it, it's like a gusher right now. But keep at it and. Um, Make common cause, find a group, local group, uh, community group, citizens group, student group, join in with others. Do, do not let yourself get to the point where uh, you have a sense of being alone. Like the news is so sobering, the latest science, the data is so sobering. Don't get to the point where you feel you're working alone in a bell jar. You are not. There are you know, hundreds of millions likely people around the world, maybe more. It'd be interesting to have someone try and assign that sometime, but you're part of a huge community and we're, we all have to have each other's backs, but we all have to keep kind of bolstering one another and, you know, having a good outlet for our outrage and turning it into action, making it move so that we're, you know, not burdened, not laden down in our work and keep doing your work be the best scientist and the most involved person that you can be. And you'll have skills aplenty and people will come and find you, but it helps when you go and look yourself and make common cause. Thank you, Nath. Uh, I think we do have a, a, not a question, but a comment from the chat saying that uh, the importance of networking by professional organizations is also Suggested like the students should be members of the oh, of APHA. Yes, the American Public Health Association has been great on climate change and health a few years back, not too many. I think it was 2017. Climate change was the annual meeting theme, and uh, they have uh, student groups. Uh, this is all, you know, it's really important to stay connected locally. Find a local community group. Ask what can you do? How can you learn from them? How can you serve them? You've got skills. I mean, face it. Even if you're, you know, in your student hood, you're gaining skills. Use them. Um, yeah. Thanks, Kate. Uh, a kind of related question to that is 
uh, you have been doing a lot of work on the science communications to the general public. So the students are wondering, you know, we do a lot of academic work, we know the, the science, but how can we better communicate this connection between climate change, health, and economic costs to their general public? Oh. Well, I mean, I could put in a plug for, you know, please stay tuned at NRDC via the, the URLs I showed you before, www.nrdc.org. But specific to the valuation work, it is our intention to keep to keep that going. And with you know new partners and new applications, because we're really interested in having a hand, doing what we can to help build that sense of the larger fabric, like the whole fabric of what are the climate sensitive events and climate sensitive health outcomes that climate change is fueling. Right now we've got like six one year and 10 another year, like little bright spots on a map that are lit up because there's data and information there. But if we're going to have a, you know, an appreciation of who do we serve with preparedness and adaptation and funding and support first, we need a more complete picture. So there's that. There's also, it occurs to me, the at Mailman School of Public Health they have put together, have organized a global consortium made up of over 250 health profession schools. Yale School of Public Health is a member. It's called the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education. Dr. Cecilia Sorensen at Mailman is the director now, and they are doing a fantastic job of putting uh, information content trainings, networking through their website. And because you're a member at Yale School of Public Health, I'm sure that there is opportunity to enrich that and participate in groups like the consortium, as well as these other membership groups there. And all of those groups would be only too happy to have you help them learn and then do about climate and health communication. I guess the last pitch on that is it definitely needs to be a part of the climate and health training, this communication piece. You don't, I don't think that we scientists should have to do a turn at a, a place like NRDC where I'm very fortunate to work with a very you know enriched and experienced communications group. But uh, we all need to have that training and learn from one another, so. Put it in the curriculum. Maybe that's a conversation you can have with your, um, with your faculty and administration. It wouldn't hurt. Thanks, Kim. Uh, and uh, because we we can have like I feel like we can have another hour discussion for on um, all these topics. But uh, unfortunately, we have another class right after this, so we have to end the discussion today. But uh, just remind everyone that uh, the recordings of this lecture will be online. So. Yeah. I'm sorry, Kai, I didn't mean to interrupt, but thank you for the opportunity. And I did have one last question. I'll tell you what, it's about a resource I don't know if people know about, the Climate Change and Human Health Literature Portal, which NIEHS put together, and it's a compendium of lots of climate and health literature. I'll be sure to give you the link so that you can dis distribute it among the folks who are here today, because it's a resource that's online. And although it's a couple years kind of behind the current, it's very, it's very good. So yeah, thank thanks you, yeah. thank you for everything you've already. given me with your questions. It's very nourishing to me. So I thank you for that, everyone. And good luck with your work. Thank you, Kim.